Let us pray. Lord, send us your Holy Spirit always that we may join our kids in always growing and practicing our faith until we are perfected and masters of this prayer life. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Happy Pentecost, everyone. Happy Pentecost. It's the day when we talk about the Holy Spirit, or sometimes we call it the Holy Ghost. It's a phrase that we use in our right wing at the 8 o'clock service, the older language. Not a phrase that we hear quite so often anymore because a ghost and spirit used to mean exactly the same thing, but In the second half of the 20th century, ghosts, we narrowed our definition of what that means to be kind of the spooky kind of Halloween ghost, the kind that the Ghostbusters are chasing after. And so we started saying, I don't know, if it's the Holy Ghost and ghosts are creepy and scary, maybe maybe we don't call them the Holy Ghost anymore. But way back in the day, there are just two different language roots for exactly the same concept. The spiritus, that's Latin, for a kind of disembodied personality, someone that you can interact with and have a relationship with, but you can't see or feel or touch. And gast, G-A-S-T, that was just the old English version of exactly the same thing. It's where we get our word ghost from. And when we say that we are aghast, You know, when we're shocked at something, it means that's where that comes from. It means kind of being taken out of your spirit, out of your own spirit, like it's kind of knocked you for a loop. So spiritus and gast from the Latin, from the Old English, all related, all are translations of the Greek word pneuma, P with a P at the beginning, pneuma. Same word that we get pneumatic from, like pneumatic tires or pneumatic drill. It's just air pressure, you know, gas pressure. And that's the word that the New Testament and that the Greek translations of the Old Testament use to talk about the Spirit of God. So the same kind of gaseous, ethereal, ghostly quality of the presence of God is is there in the Greek. And that's all based on top of this Hebrew word for the for the breath of God, which is a wonderful word, it's ruach. And you've got to lean into that CH at the end, like a breath of God, ruach. And so this ruach of God descends like a blast of wind on the gathered disciples, and they are changed forever. We celebrate that today, 50 days after the resurrection of our Lord, 10 days after the ascension of our Lord when he goes up into the sky and they never see him again. The gift, which is God's presence, the spirit, the breath, the ghost, the wind of God comes into the disciples and makes them something that they were not before. It was not the first time that it had happened, though. That breath of God had been making things from the very beginning. You all know that because you have it in your heads, how it began at the beginning. In the beginning of creation, when God made heaven and earth, the earth was without form and void, with darkness over the face of the abyss, and a mighty wind, the mighty ruach of the Creator, swept over the surface of the waters, and God said, let there be light. That's the beginning of one of our creation stories in the Bible. You know we have two, right? First Genesis and second Genesis. And second Genesis really brings us to this echo of Pentecost. It reminds us of what we heard in that first reading from Ezekiel as well. Here's how this goes. When the Lord God made earth and heaven, so way back at the beginning, 
There was neither shrub nor plant growing wild upon the earth, because the Lord God had sent no rain on the earth, nor was there any man to till the ground. A flood used to rise out of the earth and water all the surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a human being from the dust of the ground, the clay. God took those creative hands and squished together a kind of muddy mannequin, a clay uh, figure with a head and a torso and limbs stretched out on the ground, but other than that, indistinguishable from the lifeless soil of the muddy ground. And then, and then, the Lord breathed into his nostrils the ruach of life. Thus, the man became a living creature. That's how the first human being was created. The soil of this material earth that we share with the rest of creation plus the breath of the divine brings a living creature. So we keep this in the back of our minds as we hear about how a new body was created at Pentecost. Not our bodies like yours and mine, normal, ordinary human bodies, but the body of Christ. St. Paul tells us again and again in his letters that the church is the body of Christ. You and me and all one billion whatever other Christians there are around the face of the earth. That's Christ's body on earth today. One of several ways that Christ shows up, but lean into this with me here. The body of Christ, not as Adam's body formed from the mud of the clay and then enlivened by the breath of God, but the body of Christ squished together from the raw material of ordinary human lives and breathed on by the Holy Spirit to become enlivened as the body of Christ. It was a new birth, a reminder that from the moment Jesus rose from the grave, God is in the business of remaking the whole creation from scratch, of raising it out of the soil and lifting it to a new and glorious destiny. It is right for us to celebrate because we are inheritors of that new life, the breath the spirit, the ghost, the pneuma, the wind of God. What's the first thing that that body of Christ does? Well, they start to talk. And now I know some Christians who have never stopped talking ever since. Some of them are standing right here in this pulpit as we speak. But they begin speaking in a new way in a surprising way. And everyone around is surprised by it. And the reason is that there were lots of people there. It's a major feast day in Jerusalem. And people came as pilgrims to Jerusalem for the major feast days. So we heard in that second reading from Acts about where all these people were from, all the way from Libya to the Arab peoples, all of them gathered together from every corner of the world with their own distinctive languages. And suddenly these disciples with flames of fire and this rushing wind burning into their lives and turning them into the body of Christ, they start speaking. And everyone is astounded because we can understand what they're saying. That's never happened before. It's never been the case that all humanity could understand what we said. We've been so divided by language for so long. This is a surprise and a shock. It had been once upon a time, though, that humanity was not divided by language. Way back early on, when things were going so wrong, right after the story of Noah and the ark, when God was so fed up with the nonsense that we were getting up to here on earth that God said, I'm going to wipe it all out and start again because it's going wrong. I'm going to save a couple of people. I'm going to save some animals. But we've got to kind of clean house. Thanks be to God that God promised with the sign of that rainbow in the sky that God would never do that again. But right after that, and right before Abraham is called to be this first special friend of God, 
There's, a, there's an event that happens, Genesis 11. Once upon a time, which is how all good stories begin, all the world spoke a single language and used the same words. As men journeyed in the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them hard. They used bricks for stone and bitumen for mortar. Come, they said, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and make a name for ourselves. And we shall be, or we shall be dispersed over all the earth. Human pride and accomplishment. We're always trying to build stuff that glorifies us. And in this case, they said, if we build it all the way up to the heavens, then maybe we can get up to where God is. And then we can be equal with God, which is what humanity is always striving to do ever since that fruit was eaten in the garden. Then the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortal men had built, and he said, Here they are, one people with a single language, and now they have started to do this. Henceforth, nothing they have a mind to do will be beyond their reach. Come, let us go down there and confuse their speech so that they will not understand what they say to each other. And that is how... Babel was created because the Lord made there a Babel of the language of all the world and they were scattered from there. God said we cannot let them finish this tower or there will be no stopping the excesses of human pride. They will never learn humility. So ever since then, and this is the story found in our scriptures of how it was that we came to be separated by so many languages divided as humanity ever since has been divided in so many ways language culture race nation all the other ways that we are split because human pride needed to be pulled back down to earth and so here having received the wind of the breath of God and made the body of Christ the very first thing that the body of Christ does is to once again speak in the shared language of all humanity. And what is it that they speak about? The glorious power of God, which is love in manifest many ways. A language that goes deeper than any human language. And so everyone is astounded because finally this body of Christ is speaking the words that all humans need to hear of God's power, of redemption, of grace, of forgiveness, of something other than the world's ways of shame and violence. And the people can hear it and they are amazed. Not everyone's amazed, though. Some of them think that this body of Christ is out of their minds, and this is the last point. They must be drunk. What else could explain the way they're behaving? They must be drunk, these bystanders say. And Peter says, no, no, it's too early in the morning for that. Because Jerusalem is not Wisconsin on an ice fishing derby day. <laughs> I live right near Winnebago Park, uh, near um, Lake Winnebago down in Oshkosh. And so when the ice fishing tournaments are happening, all the trash cans are filled with Miller Lite uh, cases and bottles and cans by like 10 in the morning. They're filled to overflowing. And people very politely place them on the ground next to the trash cans, which I guess is good enough. But Jerusalem back then, was uh, not the same. But what, how was it that these disciples were acting that made the onlookers think they've got to be drunk? I'm convinced that the surest sign, now St. Paul tells us that there are many fruits and gifts of the Holy Spirit. You can look them up. 
cultivate them in your own life, that's all well and good. But the surest sign that the Holy Spirit is present in your life, in the life of the body of Christ, in my life, is the presence of joy. And I think those people in Jerusalem on that day were so filled with joy that they thought, well, they've got to be in at the new wine. They're giddy. They're making fools out of themselves. There's St. Barnabas turning cartwheels in the street. They're overfilled with joy because they have come to life, a life that they didn't know they were able to live before. They were filled with new power, not with new wine. They were filled with the knowledge of the presence of God. God the Father, their creator, they knew. And then Jesus had come and discovered what it is to be friends with God, and that was amazing. But now they have experienced the very presence of God, the Holy Spirit, in their hearts, as close to them as they are to their own selves, inseparably united to love that holds the universe together. Yes, they were giddy. And yes, the people watching said, what must account for this? My friends, this same Pentecost power that breathed new life into the church and made it the body of Christ on earth and that filled them with joy and the power to testify to the love and the power of God That's what we celebrate from way back in the past today. But it has gone on down through the centuries, started at Pentecost, and continues right now. You yourselves are filled with joy, whether you know it or not. But I hope you fan that into life. The breath of God has blown into the dusty recesses of your own heart. You yourselves have been empowered and equipped to testify to the power of God and his glory. It is amazing that we are able to join with these first disciples in their Pentecost power and to experience it ourselves. I pray that you all unleash that blast of wind from the depths of your own heart and let it blow like a freshening breeze through the world around us. This Pentecost power which created the body of Christ has never stopped creating and recreating. And we are just the latest round of heirs of that wonderful heritage. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who have taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that in the same spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen.